all greet him and are happy by his coming until he finally gets to the seventh heaven and that is where Ibrahim is. And then finally, and also uh, in the journey he sees Bayt al-Ma'mur which is men mentioned in Surah Al-Tur in the Quran, right? And Bayt al-Ma'mur is uh, translated as the oft-frequented house, yani it's a house of worship where, which is uh, visited very frequently by the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is said that every single day 70,000 angels pray in this Bayt al-Ma'mur in the heavens and because of the immense number of the angels, once one angel prays in it, his turn never comes again, ever. That's subhanAllah how many angels there are in the, and there's 70,000 of them. So from this we can get an idea of the magnitude of this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels. And imagine now the Prophet is witnessing all of this. And he's witnessing their salah. He's witnessing their uh, ibadah. So he's seeing all of these marvelous uh, wonders and all of this before this grand declaration of the five salawat. Everything that he is seeing is related to the prayer. Everything he is seeing is related to that ibadah, which was the ibadah of all of the prophets of Allah when they were in dunya and even uh, in the mi'raj. We see the same thing. So the momentum in this way through this journey is being built up until finally the prophets of Allah reaches Sidrat al Mundaha. This is the loved tree. It's a type of tree which is the low tree. It's found uh, here as well in the world and said that the muntaha means the low tree of the utmost boundary it's the uh, boundary that a human uh, being cannot cross you have to uh, stop there and here the prophet describes the leaves of this tree he says the leaves were like the ears of elephants huge and um, the commentary mentions that this uh, tree marks the utmost or the farthest point the world of creation ends which means it is the limit of created beings created uh, beings cannot are not allowed to go beyond that now, when the Prophet ﷺ got to this point, at the Sadrat al-Muntaha, he was covered with fog. He was covered with fog. And another narration says that the low tree actually was covered with um, moths of gold. Moths, little insects, they were made of gold, and this was covering the low tree. So perhaps that's why this was, there was this fog. And now here, from this part, I want you to hear directly from the words of the Messenger ﷺ. What does he say after this point? He says, the meaning of which is, then I was taken up above the seven heavens, and we came to Sudrat al-Muntaha, and I was covered with fog. I fell down prostrate, prostrate, and it was said to me, Indeed, the day I created the heavens and the earth, I enjoyed upon you and your ummah fifty prayers. So establish them, you and your ummah. Here is the grand declaration of the five salawat. After this amazing night journey at the Sudrat al-Muntaha, with the Prophet ﷺ falls into sajda, here the declaration comes, and of course this is directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that He had actually mandated these uh, prayers upon us on the very first day that He created the heavens uh, and the earth. And it, well, this was enjoined for the Prophet and his Ummah for all of us. Now of course you know what happens next when the Prophet has received this uh, amazing command of the five uh, salahs, he's coming back and of course he meets Musa right? and he asks him what happened. Uh, interestingly he had passed before Ibrahim uh, before Musa and Ibrahim didn't say anything. But Musa had had a lot of experience with his own people, right? With the Bani Israel. So he was uh, keen on asking him, what is it that your Lord has enjoined upon you and your Ummah? So the Prophet ﷺ told him 50 prayers and he said, oh, there's no way that they'll be able to uh, do the 50 prayers. So he goes back to Allah وسلم, and then he comes back with a reduction of 10 according to some narration. And he says, no, you have to go back, it's still too much. And so the Prophet ﷺ keeps going back and forth between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Musa salam, until the prayer is reduced to five prayers. And even at that point when the Prophet salam, came back and told Musa now it is five, he said even then go back, this is still too much. Yeah, Musa salam, said I had tried very hard with Bani Israel, he wanted the reduction to go uh, even beyond uh, five. But then at that point the Prophet salam, said I feel too shy to go before my Lord you know, again and ask him to reduce it. So the number was fixed at five. Imagine for a moment now, step back, imagine if we had 50 prayers. If you divide that, you know, we think five are hard. If we divide the 50 prayers over a 24-hour period, that comes out to 20 to 25 minutes if you're praying a certain prayer. Every 20 to 25 minutes. Now, not just in the day, but also in the night. Imagine having to get up. How would you ever sleep? Getting up every 20, you, you, you don't even have to do that with the newborn, uh, for a newborn baby, right? Getting up that frequently. And the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa reduced it to five, we have to appreciate that there is immense ease that has been placed um, by this reduction. If Allah Subhanahu wanted, He could have kept it at 50, but He did not. And 
sometimes we think that, you know, perhaps if we had been obligated with the more, we would have received more rewards. And, and that thought comes to mind, you know, if there had been more prayers, we would have been um, binding on us to pray, wouldn't we have gotten more reward? The answer will surprise you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have decreed the reward for my obligation and I have reduced the burden for my slaves and I will give a tenfold reward for each good deeds. What does this mean? There are five, but there are fifty. And the word that comes from me cannot be changed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that although there are five in number, there are fifty in reward. So again, the immense mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, once he has decreed something, once he has said that it is fifty that cannot be changed, so he preserved that in the sense of the reward of the prayer. So even though we pray five, we get the reward of ten, fifty. SubhanAllah. Now the question that comes to mind, of course, is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that we were going to uh, be obligated with only five, why did he start with fifty? He knew obviously that there were going to be five prayers. So why is he starting off with this immense number? The reason for this is to impress upon our minds that there is no other purpose of our existence except to worship Him. If it was 50 prayers and we were praying every 20, 25 minutes, including leaving our sleep for that purpose, that would not have been injustice on His part. Because it would only have been a fulfillment of what He said in Surah al verse number 56, And I have not created the jinn and the human being except to worship Him. So this story of the, from the, of the 50 to the 5 is a reminder of our true purpose in life. And the foremost uh, way of fulfilling the purpose of the ibadah is through the salah. One who is not making her salah is in, can in no way come close to fulfilling the purpose of her existence and time here on earth. Okay, now uh, that we have established the undeniable significance of the salah at this point, it should be pressed upon our minds, inshallah. Now it's important to understand what happens when someone doesn't pray. When someone leaves a prayer intentionally. Now, to understand this, we have to see what it means for something to be fard or wajib, yani obligatory, and what happens when that is violated, when it is not fulfilled. Basically, what happens uh, when a person who is uh, obligated to do something to fulfill a certain fard, when they don't do it, they incur sin. And thereby they may become liable to punishment. Now, recall that the hadith we mentioned um, about the fact that the first thing we're going to be asked about is the salah and then everything else will depend on that, right? And if it was lacking in some way, it would adversely affect all of our other actions. Now, what about the one who abandons the prayer? Who simply neglects a day in and day out, someone who is not praying, leaving the fault have to understand the fault of salah, leaving the uh, salawat that are farida, that are obligatory, is not simply just incurring sin as happens in the case of leaving any other fault. So if there's anything that's obligatory and you don't do it, what happens? You become sinful and you may be punished. This is the general rule. The salah is an exception to this rule. What happens when you don't uh, pray, you, uh, you actually enter a more dangerous zone which the Prophet warned us about in this hadith which is recorded in the Sahih of Muslim where he said There is nothing between the servant and disbelief yani kufr, except the leaving of the prayer. And there was no action that the Sahaba عنهم, considered the leaving of that kufr or disbelief except the salah. So if someone didn't fast or someone didn't give the zakah, you know, there was no uh, danger of kufr or disbelief for that person. There was serious sin. And of course that itself is not to be belittled. Obviously there is serious sin involved in leaving the salah, but it's more than that. It doesn't, doesn't just stop at you have become sinful, whereby you need to repent or you may face punishment. It's not, it goes beyond that. Because the Prophet also clarified another hadith, he said, إِنَّ الْعَهْدَ الَّذِي بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ الصَّلَاةِ فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرُ That indeed the covenant that is between us and them is the prayer, whoever leaves it has indeed committed, has indeed committed disbelief. And this is not the case for leaving any other form of action. Now, <clears throat> what critical lesson do we learn from this? We learn from this that Islam is not just about believing in your heart. It's not sufficient to believe in Allah and the Day of Judgment and His angels and the books and everything that we're required to believe in. It must be coupled with action. And the foremost, most basic required action is the prayer, is the salah. You notice in the Quran when you read over and over again, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمَنُوا Those that 
uh, who believe and do good deeds. You never see praise for the people in the Quran or never says, Aladina Aman, those who believe. Because remember, Shaitan also believes in Allah, right? And the Day of Judgment. He believes in all of these things. However, it's not enough to simply have belief in order to be considered a believer, in order to be considered a